All right. I did, uh, I did share with you, um, that, uh, I will be going through controversial subjects after finishing fundamentals of the faith that took us quite some time. I want to go through some subjects that are whether in the world out there or even within the um, um, churches, among churches, they're controversial. But there are reasons why we have to address them. This church is still um, a baby church. And I, I need to set the direction where we're heading with this church. What kind of theology are we subscribing to? Right? So we've, we've covered in three sessions mental health. What does the Bible say about mental health? As opposed to what the world says. Um, so that's, that's done. That's done. And I'm really glad that we finished this, put that behind us, because it was a bit heated, and, um, but it was good. I also want to cover some areas in, in parenting, particularly with young men and teenagers. Then I want to discuss um, a theme, it's going to take maybe se several weeks, about dating and courtship I've been asked to address this again um, what the Bible says about this stuff versus what the world says and we need to draw a distinction what does it look like for our children who are either ripe for courting or they're heading there in a few years how do we deal with this in a holy way with the, that demarcation line between unbelievers and believers are very, very clear, without being legalistic. And um, there are a couple of other more subjects. But for today, and it's going to take us several weeks, we're going to talk about something called modified Sabbatarianisms. Sabbatarianism. Now, what does this mean? Does anybody know what this means? You want me, do you want me to give you a clue? Ah, oh, look, without a clue. Go, Mary. <laughs> um, maybe about, uh, live, out the live out the Sabbath in the New Testament. Okay, maybe how to live out the Sabbath in the New Testament. Okay. All right. That's very, very good, uh, sister, and I'll help you to know a little bit more about it, but it's in the light of this fundamental command. This is all one command. Out of how many commands, by the way? I'm reading from Exodus 20, verse 8. 10. Were you giving me a hug or were you saying 10? 10. All right. All right. I love you too, brother. <laughs> It's going like this. Um, this is probably one of the uh, commandments um, that is most dismissed and disregarded. We focus on, all right, you know, don't worship idols and we expand. We'll flesh that out. Uh, maybe uh, the one after is honoring your parents and we say it's so important to honor your parents and we go and we grab our children and we open uh, Proverbs and we tell them, look what it says, you know, look what it says, you know, if you, if you please your father, if you, uh, if you, you know, don't, don't be embittered, don't, don't make your mom, uh, bittered by your behavior and so on and so forth. And obviously about covetousness and murder and, and all those. But when we come to this command, it's, it's disregarded, it's overlooked. Sometimes for right reasons and other times all for the wrong reasons. We want to visit this. We want to know, is it relevant or is it not relevant? What is relevant out of this command, out of that command of the Ten Commandments, 
what is relevant to us, how do we apply that in our lives, and what is not relevant, and what we ought to dismiss and disregard. Uh, but to disregard it all together and overlook it, while it's, we know, written in the Ten Commandments, there is something fundamentally wrong about this. I do want to open it up for discussion. We want to, I want to invite you to, as we progressively go through this systematically, bit by bit, and it's going to take us a little while, but you know what? It's going to be a good thing because in the process, as we begin to understand the depth and, and, uh, and the breadth of this command, we will learn so much stuff in, in terms of theology, in terms of the scripture, and how the scripture links itself with itself and, uh, and, and how it supports each other. Okay, we're going to learn a lot through that process. It's going to take several weeks. It's not a one once off week. Um, And as I am going through it, breaking it down progressively, systematically, if you feel the urge to say, I I disagree with, with, you know, decency and respect, and, and with some rationality, I'm happy for us in a, in a, in a spirit of humility that you would disagree. And then we talk about, well, why? And if I'm wrong, I'm happy to repent and, and change my view. But if you're wrong, I would love for you to repent and change your view. Okay? All right. Agreed? A good deal? All right. All right. Here we go. Now, how are we going to start this? This is how we're going to start it. We're not going to go jump right away into the Sabbath and the command of the Sabbath and whether it's binding or not and how far is it binding or not. Before we jump into that command and try to understand it, something else that I want to discuss as a, if you like, the prep work for this. And that is three parts of the law. Does anybody know what this means? The three parts of the law. No? Anyone? The three parts of the law. Have you heard this before? Or the three divisions? The law is divided into three parts. What is that? Yeah, Alex, all the way at the back. Go, brother. There is a ceremonial law. Yes. Um, okay, that's it. I let everybody, <laughs> someone asked to say as well. <laughs> <laughs> you got one right. That's good, man. Praise God. All right. Yes. Coming in. Uh, the second one is civil law and then moral law. Yeah. yeah. So have you heard this before? Hands up if you never heard of the three divisions, the three part division. Put your hand up. I just want to know. Okay. All right. All right. Now, this this is what theologians based on the Scripture, um, many theologians based on the Scripture subscribe to, but not all. Okay? Um, they, They say the Old Testament law, we're talking here about the Old Testament law, Okay, they break it down into three components. All right, one, two, three. Not exactly now. Or it can be diff- it can be different depending on. Doesn't matter who who speaks about it. But the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. So they grab the Old Testament and they say, okay, well this part is moral law, this part civil law, and so on and so forth. But particularly, you find them in, in, in not the entire Old Testament, because by the way, no added law was given in the Old Testament after what? After the first five books written by Moses. Everything else in, in uh, prophets... Everything else in the writings affirm this and call upon people to abide by the laws given in those first five books. 
but nothing else has been introduced in the Old Testament after those five books were written by Moses. Okay, so you can even narrow down and say the three parts of the law, really what we're talking about is the three parts of what Moses wrote, the law that Moses wrote. Now the moral law, and here is the thing, <clears throat> focus, what does the moral law focus on? It's a universal moral principles, right? Universal moral principles. What does this mean? Do you know, Matt? So they're summed up exactly. So they're summed up those moral laws in what? What is the most condensed, summarized version of the moral law? The Ten Commandments. Okay? Don't murder, don't cover, don't steal, uh, don't commit adultery. Those are the most basic. Of course, the, ten, the rest of the Ten Commandments are the most basic uh, level, if you like, of the moral law. An idea is a universal moral principle. What does this mean? Universal moral principles. It applies to every person. Does it only apply for a group? No, absolutely not. And and it's it's perpetual, meaning continual. It doesn't there wasn't a point in time in history where it was okay for someone to commit adultery. Right? There wasn't a point in time in history where it was okay for someone to commit murder, like Cain and Abel, right? Even though the Ten Commandments came way, way later, years later, but did that make it okay for Cain to murder Abel? Absolutely not. That's a moral law, and we say the moral law is, is, it applies to all humans in all of history, across all cultures. Right? Whereas the civil law, the focus is social order and justice in Israel. What does that mean? And somebody can give us examples. There was say like who will inherit the the land or properties from whom and how to divide it between the the childrens. If someone hurt someone, how to make the uh, compensations or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So it's not about murdering someone, or that, but it's more to do with okay, let's let's deal with the situation at hand. How should man punish man? For disobeying the law. How does that punishment occur? Or how do we deal with civil situations, civil matters? Right? Uh, for example, they would say one of the laws would be if a man digs a hole on the ground and then somebody's ox would pass by and falls into this hole and then dies, then what happens? This man who's responsible for that hole has to re has to compensate the owner of that ox, for example. These are civil matters. Okay? Civil law. They call it theocratic law. All right? Laws to do with civil matters. And God gave Moses this law, civil law, for Israel at that time. Right? And then you have the third ceremonial law, religious rituals and worship. What does that mean? Can you give us examples of ceremonial law? Like when a person was found to be unclean and they mm. had to stay outside the camp, I think for like seven days or something. Yeah. And what they had to do in order to return. Yeah. And... Yeah, good. Anyone else? And that, by the way, confused a lot of people during COVID when they didn't have their head around moral law, civil law, ceremonial law, and some people started practicing ceremonial law, right? Remember that? Ceremonial law. So what is ceremonial law? Again, and I'll tell you how they wrongly practiced it. What is there a ceremonial law? Give us more examples of those ceremonial laws. Separation between what? 
holy and holy, clean and unclean. They're all ceremonial laws, right? Uh, you have the temple, for example. You know, you have the holy of holies. Holy of holies. Uh, who goes in there? The high priest. And how often? Once a year. And then after that? Like, what's the room after this? There's a veil. And what's the room after it? Holy place. Who goes there? Priests. And then you've got the court for the men. And in the court for the Jewish women. And then Gentiles. These are rituals. All right? This is not moral law. This is not civil matter issues. These are rituals. They're all pointing to something. You've got the burnt offerings, you know, the altar and the lambs and, the, you know, how, how they get slaughtered. All of those are rituals. And you have, like what we talked about, is you have those um, um, people with diseases, particular diseases such as leprosy. And what do they do if you are found with leprosy? You moved away, you're not allowed to come, you are unclean, and you have to remain in that state until you, you get healed somehow. Only when you're healed, and then priests have to affirm that you're healed, you come in. Right? Okay. You with me? So how many laws do we have? How many kinds of laws do we have? Three. What are they? Excellent. Now the scope. I'm giving you just a, an overview of this and then we're going to look into verses, passages in the scripture to support this. But I need to give you what we're trying to argue for. All right. Then the scope. Moral law, who does it apply to? Everyone. We already spoke about this. Civil law, who does it apply to? Israel. Right? It's a theocratic country and it needed its own laws and so it applies to them and what about ceremonial law israel again all right it's ceremonial for israel god never commanded um gentile nations uh, assyrians babylonians to practice ceremonial law only to israel right so what was the flaw that we talked about earlier on that people practiced during covid Clean and unclean. And they said, oh, look, you know, we are the temple. And, you know, if you have COVID, you're unclean. And if you don't have COVID, you're clean, right? But these, these words from Leviticus, they're ceremonial law. They're not moral law. And they apply only to whom? To Israel back then. Right? Not even today. Now, why is this... A um, the moral law, why does it apply to all humans of all time? Purpose. What's the purpose? That God gave moral law. Hmm? It reveals God's character. It reveals who God is. You know that God is pure. How do we know that God is pure? Because he says, you shall not commit adultery. We know that God is a giver of life. How do we know that? Because he says, you shall not murder. We know that God is truth. Shall not be a false witness. Okay? It reveals the character of God. Moral law in the Ten Commandments, summarized, condensed in the Ten Commandments, reveal the character of God. And we'll look at that later, right? Civil law, what's the purpose of the civil law? Well, Think about it. If Israel back then during the time of Moses, they didn't have a king. How they, they didn't have a government. They didn't have anything. So how are they going to ensure the safety of every man and every woman? They, they needed something to regulate the judicial matters. All right? And uh, civil ceremonial law, What's the purpose of the ceremonial law? Can somebody tell us in your own words, what is the purpose of the ceremonial law? 
There's a lot of groundwork that we're doing, but rest assured we're getting somewhere. But you know what I'm like, right? I have to set the ground first, mate. Take you step by step. So when I give you the punchline, you have nowhere to go. <laughs> you can't run, all right? But I've got to take you step by step, all right? I'm leading you into somewhere. Now, what's the purpose of ceremonial law? Simple. It points to whom? To more specifically, Jesus Christ, all right? His redemptive work. Whatever you look at in a ceremonial law, always, all the time, whether the temple, whether the first room, second room, third room, the unclean, the leprosy and the uncleanness of the leprosy, everything points to Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, okay? Well, it, that, and since that is the case, <clears throat> Let's keep that one. We gave the examples. Christ, did Christ fulfill the moral law? He has, right? He fulfilled the moral law, right? Has he fulfilled the civil law? Believe it or not, he did fulfill the civil law. Has he fulfilled the ceremonial law? He is the fulfillment of the ceremonial law. He fulfilled all the law. So we're not breaking it down as though to say which part of the law Jesus fulfilled. He fulfilled all of them. Okay? The issue is not what part of the law Jesus fulfilled. We recognize Jesus fulfilled all of them. The issue is which law is binding for us today. That's the issue. Okay? And we already know. There's no brainer once you break it down this way to say that it's the moral law that is binding today. All the other laws are not, right? All the other laws are not. Now, you with me? Now, I've defined to you a, a concept that theologians came up with. Does that mean all theologians agree with this? No. What is another view? The way people perceive the covenants and whether they've been fulfilled and whether they're yet to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. And what do they say about this? They say, <clears throat> anybody wants to say anything or should I just jump in? I feel free? All right. They say, oh, no, scrape all that. Don't worry about all of that. We ought to, um, if we want to know what command, what moral law binding upon us, don't look at the Old Testament at all. Look at the New Testament. Look at the commandments in the New Testament. Whatever is being repeated in the New Testament, that is binding. If it's not there, it is no longer binding. Okay? And this began about 150 years ago, maybe stretch it 180 years ago. All right? Where people began to say, forget about those divisions. Let's come up with our own a set of ways to say what is binding, what is not, and then we conclude that only the New Testament commandments are binding. Anything in the old, don't worry about it, unless the New Testament repeats it. Okay? So that's that has now become a tension among theologians. Once upon a time, there was no tension for 1,800 years, there was no tension. Everybody agreed on this, only just recently that this has come about. And so we need to think, do we go back and say, no, sorry, we're going to subscribe to the three parts law or... Do we say, no, we are going to subscribe to the 
um, new theologians and say there are no divisions. They're all the same, one and the same, in a bucket, take that bucket, and since that was part of the quote-unquote old covenant, let's chuck it all away and let's just focus on the New Testament. It makes a big difference, huge difference. You know why? Why? Why would it make a big difference? Why is it so important to know which direction we should go? I hope you're not quiet because you had a long day at work and now you're falling asleep. I hope you're just thinking. I hope this silence is because you're thinking. Are you thinking? Good, thank you. At least I had one head saying, yes, I am thinking. <laughs> All right, let me, let me stir up those of you who had a long day at work and then coming and sitting down here and just... And sitting just to receive an answer without using this muscle. Here in, in, in this church, particularly on Tuesday night, we reject intellectual laziness. Amen? Amen? Does God honor intellectual laziness? Are you going to sit back and sleep and just wait for the final answer? Come on. <laughs> We we'll have to lay our hands on this man and pray for him to repent. Good. So we need to think carefully which path we ought to take. Why? Why is this huge? Is it um, so we know that you know you know in the New Testament what are we bound mm. with? What is binding to us? Like what is it that we have to? Specifically, follow. Yeah, w w w and and in, in, absolutely, hundred percent. You will never say anything wrong, Lydia. <laughs> My wife is always, <laughs> almost always right. <laughs> Eventually, especially, um, well, number one. There are a lot of things that the scripture speaks about in the Old Testament. And if we just reject the entire Old Testament, we, and, and it could be true, it could be, it could be, sorry, the, the three parts, if it's true, and we reject the Old Testament, we may be sinning while, in, while we're, we're not realizing. And that's a huge thing. If we take sin seriously as God does take it seriously, we need to assess. Because, because when Jesus died, which sin did he die for? All sins. So all sins are important. We need to know. Are we walking thinking that we are okay and we're little by little growing a little but in reality we're actually sinning? By overlooking commandments in the Old Testament. Or the other way around. If suppose that this is not true, and there are some Old Testament commands that we're trying to abide by, when in reality Jesus freed us from that, and you don't have to abide by them. And so it can be a freeing thing. Much like, remember the example of ceremonial law when some people thought that it's still binding till today. And so they said, well, COVID equals leprosy. And if leprosy don't come to the temple, they COVID, And then they bound themselves in different ways. And they're wrong. Okay. So what do we do? Okay. We're going to take it one step at a time. Okay. Well, first of all, what do you think? My convictions. <laughs> I believe it is correct. Three parts of the law. 
All right. I believe that scripture makes it absolutely clear. If we study it without intellectual laziness, we will find that, that the scripture itself testifies that there are three parts of the law. And I'm going to present this case to you. All right. I will present it to you by multiple, many, many verses. Certainly not all, but many. But before this, I just want to give you a list of those who endorse not the Sabbatarianism, but the three parts of the law. Okay? You will find the following. Do you know the Westminster Confession of Faith? I hope you do. It's a great um, condensed version of theology that is great. And the Second London of Confession, they both subscribe to it. All right. Well, for those who are theologians among us, they say, well, that's, that's, these are covenantal people. Okay. You're right. But John MacArthur is not. And if you study carefully, just if you have a, an electronic version and just search for ceremonial law, you will find it's plethora. So many different places where the study Bible affirms this division. It says, I didn't make it up. It's there in a John MacArthur study Bible. Okay? Maybe that eased a lot of you when I said this. Obviously, Vody Bockham, Joel Beakey, and Arsis Prawl, and obviously all reformers and Puritans all subscribe to that, those three divisions. Okay? So, calm down. Take it easy. Put your guard down. But start thinking. I want you to own this. I don't want you to think, well, since they all own it, therefore I'm going to own it. I want you to think about it. I want you to build your own convictions. Please. Okay? So how are we going to do this? <clears throat> I want to show you from the scripture, starting from the... The first five books of the Bible, Le Deuteronomy and Leviticus, show you some examples how God in his way indicate differences between these um, types. So I've got here two passages that I want to copy and paste. If the font is small, what should you do? <laughs> All right, let me try to make it reasonably large. I've got a fair bit of passages here. I pray that those of you who could take coffee, drink coffee, that you drank a barrel of coffee because we're going to go through a lot of passages and I need you to focus, right? So the first is Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. Five books of the Bible. <clears throat> and again, I'm just giving you a quick glimpses so you understand. It's there. Notice in the command here in Deuteronomy 14, 21. <sighs> Somebody would like to read it? Go, Mary. And then somebody wants to read that big long chunk, Leviticus 18 afterwards. Please get ready. You shall not eat anything which dies of itself. You, you, may, you may give it to the alien who is in your town so that he may eat it. Or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a holy people to Yahweh your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. All right. What's it saying here? <laughs> what you eat, right? It's about some dietary uh, consumption, right? Particularly about what? Something dies of itself. What should you do with something that dies of itself? Can you eat it? You can't eat it. All right, well, chuck it in a, in a bin. No. What, what does it say here that you can do with it? You can, 
You can give it away to aliens who's in your town. All right. So some dude passes by who's from Canaan or Jamaica or whatever. You give it to him. Or if you can make money out of it, hey, go ahead. Let them eat it as much as they like. But you, you don't eat it. Is that moral law or ceremonial law? What sort of law is this that abides by you, binding to you, but is not binding to anyone else? Yeah. Have a look the contrast between that, which is, the Bible says, legitimate for others to have it, but not legitimate to you. Whereas in Leviticus 18, and by the way, the entire Leviticus 18, if you haven't read it, you should go ahead and read it, right? It talks about sexual conduct. See what it says, somebody else. Yep. Someone at the back, oh, okay. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. You shall right. What is it? An abomination. To do what? What is what is abomination? Homosexuality. Homosexuality is abomination, right? Did I say this? No. Well, I did say it. I just said it in front of you. <laughs> but what am I repeating? What am I referring to? Why am I saying this? Because God's word says it. Right? Go on. Also, oh sorry. Also, you shall not have intercourse with an animal to be defiled with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is a perversion. That's disgusting, right? That's sickening, right? Do you think this is binding, by the way, or not? Yes. Yes. Where do you find this in the, in the New Testament, by the way? Do you find it in the New Testament? Tell me. If you read the New Testament, I read it several times. Countless times. I don't recall I saw it anywhere in the New Testament. Right? So if you're going to say that this division does not exist, then you're going to have to tell me why someone should not do this. It's so disgusting, so appalling that I cannot say it. Right? Why should a man or a woman not do this if it is not found in the New Testament? Why are you putting... Burden upon people's shoulders. Let them have pleasure. It's disgusting. All right, go on. Do not defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all these, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled. Therefore, I have brought its punishment upon it. So the land has spewed out its inhabitants. But as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. For the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations and the land has become defiled so that the land, so, so that the land will not spew you out. You should defile it. You should defile it. No, you shouldn't. Sorry, you shouldn't defile it. You should not defile it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> should you defile it as it has spewed out the nation which has been before you? Okay. Notice here, who does God say must not commit this sin? Hey. Even a native and the alien. Whereas here, the alien and the foreigner can eat food. So there are exceptions. Whereas this one, any exception to the rule? No exception to the rule. Even in that first five books, you can tell there is a distinction between particular law and another kind of law. All right? Who's bound to this? Everyone. Whether they receive the Ten Commandments or not, right? Everyone is bound. Okay, good. <clears throat> well, now you know that the, the Bible is written this way. You've got the Moses and then prophets, they call it like that, and the, and the writings, which is all the other 
Old Testament letters. You'll find in all the other Old Testament letters something that tells you there is a distinction between some laws given by God and other laws. And it's repeated over and over again. I've got so many references here, but I'll show you just, it'll suffice to show you one of them. Micah um, seven, 6 verses 7 and 8. And then we'll, what I'll do is we'll move into the New Testament because that, that, that even goes even further. Look what it says, verses 7 and 8 of Micah. Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Has he, he has told you, O man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? In other words, what does that mean? What does it mean, does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams? Mm -hmm. But I thought God is the one that commanded the Israelites to perform sacrifices. What's he saying here? Let me show you another passage just similar to this. So what does this mean? Does it refer to in 1 Samuel when Saul was going to give sacrifices and not wait for Samuel and he directly disobeyed God in doing so? So God prefers your obedience rather than your sacrifices. 100%. Look, has Yahweh as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? This we call that ceremonial law. See for ceremonial, right? And in obeying the voice... As in obeying the voice of Yahweh, this is what we call moral law, right? There is ceremonial law and there is moral law. Behold, to obey, which is, which law? Moral law is better than ceremonial law. And to heed then, to heed, that is, oops, moral law. Fat of rams, that is ceremonial law. God says, okay, not all my law are equal of the same importance, of the same significance. There are some laws that I, gave, that I give you that are far more important than other laws. And he places here which law above which law? The moral law above Ceremonial law. So that division is clearly seen in the Old Testament. Right? In the first five books, in, um, in the prophets and the writings, let me show you what Jesus says about this. He refers to the similar concept. And what does Jesus say in Matthew 23, 23? He refers to the same thing. Right? This is what Jesus says. I do want to finish this today, but I don't know if I can. He says this, yeah. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you, for you tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, and have neglected the what? Weightier provisions of the law. Breaks it down. You've got tithing, uh, mint, dill, and cumin, which are ceremonial laws. And he says, there is something else of more important. And what is it that is more of important of, that law, of a law? Justice, mercy, faithfulness, 
But these are things you should have done without neglecting the others. So he's not saying, don't worry about the ceremonial law. Of course, because Jesus came while he was under the law, which means he's still under the old covenant. So, of course, all the ceremonial law were operational at the time when Jesus came. And he's saying, I'm not saying don't do them, but which is more important? The moral law. Who draws the distinction? God does. It's Jesus, who is God, says, these are weightier than that. If you have any question about what we're talking about so far, let, let me know. Now, things are more interesting as we continue in the Gospels. I'll just, I'm just giving you from every section only a verse, or sorry, a, a couple of passages to, to show you that there are um, distinctions. This is Father. <clears throat> All right. John 4, 21. Jesus says, that's to whom? Samaritan woman. You all right? He says to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming. It's coming in the future. Huh? When neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Because God commands people, if they want to worship him, where do they worship him? In the temple. Right? And he says, that time, there is a time will come where that command will be abolished. It's gone. We don't need, if I want to worship God, I don't need to go to have a flight and go to Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem and go find my way to the temple and then I'll go and worship God there. I don't need to do that anymore. It's been abolished, right? That command is abolished. But yet... In Matthew 5.17, what does Jesus say? Remember 5.17? We call that the Sermon on the Mount. And, and what did Jesus preach there? Did he preach, preach a ceremonial law? No. What was it? Moral law. You have heard of old, you shall not murder. But I say unto you, anger is the heart of murder. If you commit adultery, but I say unto you, if you lust with uh, with, a, uh, with a woman and you, you already you commit adultery already in your heart so that's the moral law he's preaching the moral law okay and after and upon preaching the moral law or preceding preaching the moral law he says what do not think that I came to abolish the law what I thought you said to that woman that there is a law that is going to be abolished yet here you say you're not going to abolish the law are you going to abolish the law? You're not going to abolish the law. Right? It says, I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. I did, what? What are you talking about, Jesus? Jesus just contradicted himself. No, he did not. In one section, he speaks of the ceremonial law, but not in the context of Matthew 5. In Matthew 5, he's talking about the moral law. There are distinctions between the two. Right? One of them will have been abolished by the death of Jesus and his resurrection, and the other has not been. And we'll see this in the epistles. Have I lost you? Are you guys with me? Yes. Are you, have you slept? Yes. I know. <laughs> All right. So I need to make sure that you're aware of this, especially for you when you're reading the scripture and you say, wow, thank you, God, you are abolished the law. But then you read later on. Well, the, law, the law has not been abolished. What's going on? Well, you read it in context. What you will always find whenever it speaks of the abolishment of the law, it's talking about what? Ceremonial law. And why was it in what ground has it been abolished? Jesus Christ. He came to fulfill it. In what sense did he come to fulfill the ceremonial law? It was a shadow. You read that in Hebrews 10.1 or Colossians 2, we've gone through it. It was a shadow and Jesus is the substance. Shadow, he's a substance of which law? Ceremonial law. It is abolished. The shadow is gone. But the moral law, so I'll show you one more thing in the epistles to show you the, diff, the contrast between the two, right? And then we'll open it up for questions. 
So if you have a question, sister, just remember it. Please, we'll just go through this and then we'll come back and we'll answer that question. Now here, who wrote Romans? Paul, right? Who wrote Ephesians? Same guy. It's not a different guy, right? And look what he says. Do we then nullify the law through faith? Meaning abolish the law or more specifically specifically set it aside? He says, may it never be on the contrary, what do we do? We establish the law, just like Jesus said here. I did not come to abolish the law. So he's agreeing with Jesus in so far as Romans 3, 31. He's establishing the law. He's not getting rid of that law. He's establishing it. But yet at the same time, Ephesians 2, 14 and 15, for he himself is our peace. Who's he? Jesus Christ, not Paul. All right? Is our peace who made both groups into one. And by the way, which two groups is he talking about here? Jews and Gentiles brought into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Remember the temple? All right, you've got the first room, the high priest, then the priest, then the men and the women. And then after the women is a wall of division. And after that wall of division, what's there? Gentiles. No matter how much you love God, right? You're a Gentile. You come to enjoy God, but you're all the way at the back, right? <clears throat> so Jesus here broke down the barrier of dividing wall. By the way, this law, what sort of law is this? Moral law, civil law, ceremonial law, ceremonial law, okay? Broke down the barrier of dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. What's the enmity here? Which is the law. Huh? The law of commandments containing ordinances. The law... I thought you said here yeah, we establish the law. We don't nullify, we establish it. How is it that you're saying here yeah, we abolish it? Do we establish or do we abolish? Which one? Hmm? Why is he saying in one sense he's established in the other place he says abolished? Different laws. He even tells you here, right? Ordinances. Rituals, ceremonials, ceremonial laws, right? So when you read the scripture, when you open the word of God, and it says, okay, the law has been abolished. Ah, cool. I can go and do what Leviticus 18 says. No, he's not talking about the moral law. He's talking about ceremonial law. <clears throat> so that's where you say, Cool. I don't have to put aside my brother who's sick because he's got leprosy. I don't have to do that anymore. That's ceremonial law and that has been abolished by Jesus Christ. Right? I don't have to be a, a, a woman and it's a time of the month and, 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 and I can't go to church anymore. That's been abolished. Okay? That's been abolished by the death of Jesus Christ. But what has not been abolished... <clears throat> and it's been established is the moral law. Right? So, clearly, the scripture makes distinction. And I can go on and on and on, but it suffices to, to do this. I just wanted to get a, a glimpse of different categories so that you are aware the entire scripture from beginning till the end makes distinction. Between civil, between the moral law and ceremonial law. Of course, you can throw in there the civil law as well, but that's just easy to debunk. So that's okay. Put that aside. Yes, sister. Question? Mal, just mic, please, so people can hear and live stream. Um, you know how you said that, uh, that Leviticus 18. Yes. Is not found in the New Testament. Yeah. Um, but is it part of Matthew 5? Yeah. So, 
So the spirit of this, we talk about this, right? Oh, where is it? <clears throat> also, you shall not have intercourse with any animal. I mean, that's just disgusting, but anyway. To be defiled with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is a perversion. So what we say is this. Remember I said, what is the Ten Commandments? What does it tell you about the Ten, the ten the, the Moral Law? Uh, what's the relationship between the Ten Commandments and the Moral Law? It is the most basic, the summarized, condensed. It is not at its full length, full depth. It is just the basic of it. <clears throat> Jesus came in the New Testament and then he pulled that out and then unpacked it just a little bit more just to tell you it is not just about what you do as though that you only abide by the moral law only by your actions but you've but it's about what you desire from your heart all right it's about your desire not just your action so he's he's saying don't look at the external obedience Look at the depth, look at the spiritual obedience of it. But he only just kept it at that li and limited it to that. He didn't go and flesh it out further, although it can be, right? Yeah, no, I'm just asking yes, because so you're right. I, heard, um, I heard a sermon by Vodi once and he was saying that people like LGBT, one of their arguments is that it's not, in the New Testament, but then he made a reference to Matthew 5. And so I was just wondering yeah. where it fits in. So so, he, so the scope of what Jesus said, all right, if you commit adultery, if you look at women with a lust, you commit adultery in your heart. He's taking people to say, don't look just only examine yourself or judge yourself by your external actions, but look internally at the condition of your heart. All right, because sexual sin does not only... Uh, constitute your action but your own desire as well of course within that you can unpack it further based on Leviticus 18 and say hey not just looking at a woman with lust but intercourse with animal that's another sexual sin as part of it whether a man or a woman so it unpacks it more if you like yeah because at the time of Jesus they were externalists, they were self-righteous people, and they only focused on the external actions. But the internal, they said, nah, that's just something for me. Mm. Yes? Wait, just my quick. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so is there anything in the New Testament which, um, when it comes to affirm that God did not, that Christ did not nullify the law, but fulfilled the law, um, is there anything in that that can be misconstrued by like, say, you know, like those who are practicing still ceremonial and orthodox and all this sort of stuff there? Um, is there anything in there that can be misconstrued where they say, well, Jesus didn't nullify, Jesus didn't nullify, right? He, he fulfilled, <coughs> right? And so, yeah. it, you know, if they read it in context, would they be able to see at every mention that it is about ceremony? Well, about Moral law, you mean? No, but uh, sorry, that 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 what has been, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. and that the river, and then the opposite is true as well. That yeah. what has then been nullified is the yeah. ceremonial. Look, just like the devil can take any passage out of context when he did tempt Jesus, he took it out of context. He used the scripture, but he took it out of context. Mm. When he tempted Eve, he took what God said, but took it out of context and then just later on threw in a lie, right? Mm. So also anybody can take the Bible if you do not read it in context mm. properly, all right, and read and understand and exegete properly mm. what it says. You can take anything out of context, mm. right? You can, you, can, you can say, oh, well, this is Old Testament. Oh, I can do it now. Right, you can do that, but if you under if you read the scripture properly and just to answer more specifically your question, yeah. and you look what Jesus says, all right, in in Matthew five, mm. he, from the very beginning till the end, he only mentions the moral law. Blessed are, are the poor in spirit. Mm. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. Because is that what they would typically <clears throat> go to when they say, "See, this is why we continue." The, the because, Orthodox, yeah. That? Well, I I mean. Like when when they're saying, but but because Depends we, we, we often to, there's hear no for the you know you do realize the only um, you know Christian body that does not have um, 
uh, statement of faith. Mm. An official statement of faith is Orthodox. Even Catholic do have, but I think Orthodox don't have a, a mm. statement of faith. So it will be, it will boil down to who you speak to. Mm. All right. This guy says that, or this guy says that. Mm. You know, I don't know. So do we understand this? Let's wrap it up quickly because we're, we've gone over time by two minutes. We spoke about, well, we're going to, we are going to be talking about uh, the Sabbath, where does it reside within our life as Christians in this dispensation of time? All right. How far do we obey and, and where do we say we are freed from it? Okay. We need to look at this. We need to understand this since it is written in the Ten Commandments. Then we looked at the three parts of the law. What are they? See. Excellent. Moral, civil, ceremonial. Um, the civil, is it binding? No. The civil, is it binding? No. But what is binding? Moral law, right? For all people in all time, across all cultures. Why is that? Why is it binding? We're going to look at it next time, by the way. Why is it binding? Because it reveals who? The character of God, right? And since God never changes and God is God, no matter where you go or when you go, therefore the moral law abides forever. It will never change, never alter. And by the way, if the Ten Commandments, and that's something that we have to agree on next week, we're going to look into that. If the Ten Commandments is the basic moral law, and if we can prove that in the, in the New Testament, then by implication, there, that command, that Sabbath, to keep it holy ought to be binding. But how far? We'll see that next week.